Hello, I'm Erica from the Teen Department at the Columbus Public Library. And I'm Keyshawn from Adult Services. Today we're starting our voter education series, and we're going to be focusing on your rights as a voter, as well as federal and state laws that protect those rights. If you're unsure or skeptical about voting, we're going to list the reasons why we think you should vote. We'll discuss the voting process in the state of Georgia, as well as who administers elections, so you know where to start and who to contact if you run into issues concerning your right to vote. We'll cover any changes that have been made to the voting process or situations to expect due to COVID-19, and also provide you with an election calendar and resources to all the topics we've covered in this presentation. So let's get started. First, we'd like to go over what we hope to achieve with this series of videos. The goal of this series is to prepare people in the community, specifically teens and young voters, to vote in elections. We are not here to tell you who to vote for, but we want to provide you with the information on how to vote and prevent you from encountering any difficulties during this process. We'll be covering information on how to register to vote, voting rights and laws, filling out ballots correctly, American Government 101, and resources. How to register to vote. How do you register to vote in Georgia? What are the requirements? Where do you go? Is there an automatic registration, same day registration, or online registration options? How do you verify your voter registration status? Voting rights and laws. What are the federal voting laws that protect your right to vote? Filling out ballots correctly. This is to ensure that you get to the polls on election day and that you know how to fill out a ballot correctly without any mistakes. American Government 101. This is just basic information on the American government system so you know how it operates and most importantly, you understand the roles and responsibility of the person you're voting for. Like, what is the role of the president? How many representatives does Georgia have and what do they do? What is a senator's term limit? And how exactly does the Electoral College work? Resources. We want to give you all the proper tools so that you feel confident when you go to vote on Election Day. This will include nonpartisan governmental sources, apps that help with fact checking, and book recommendations that help you understand the issues that you care about. With that being said, we also want to stress that all information provided will be unbiased. We are not here to tell you who to vote for. We are only here to provide resources and recommendations that will help highlight certain issues, give you information on candidates and how candidates feel about those issues. But we won't volunteer any opinions of our own. We're just here to give you the information and tools that you need for this election. In addition, we'd also like to add that none of this content is originally ours. It's been taken from other sources in order to provide you with facts, but there is no commentary from either of us. There will be links on each slide that will be gathered in a document that you can access so that you know exactly where all of this information is coming from. Again, we want it to be as unbiased as possible, so we relied heavily on government and nonpartisan sources. Maybe you think voting is a waste of time or that the system is rigged in a certain way to prevent change. While we understand that sometimes politics can make a person feel discouraged and cynical, we want to give you information that will hopefully change your mind and empower you. Here are a few reasons why we think it's important to participate in elections. Number one, it's your right. This right has long been denied to many people and fought for by people in the past. There are several amendments in our Constitution that highlight the struggle that different groups of people have had to go through in order to obtain this basic right. African American men were given the right to vote in 1870 with the introduction of the 15th Amendment. Even though this right was now included in the Constitution, in certain regions in the U.S., African Americans would still have to face significant barriers to voting until the Voting Rights Act of 1965. American women were given the right to vote in 1920 with the passing of the 19th Amendment. Poll taxes were eradicated in 1964 when the 24th Amendment was ratified. 
In the past, poll taxes were used as a way to prevent many African Americans from voting. Poll taxes were eradicated in 1964 when the 24th Amendment was ratified. In the past, poll taxes were used as a way to prevent many African Americans from voting because they were essentially a voting fee that many could not pay. Poor whites were given exemptions from this fee by evoking the Grandfather Clause, which meant they could point to an ancestor prior to the Civil War who had voted. In 1971, the 26th Amendment made the legal voting age for all elections 18. Number two, you pay taxes and by voting, you can decide how they will be spent. The elected officials from the local, state, and federal level determine how tax money is going to be spent on the public. This is why voting for a candidate in every election that most aligns with how you think this money should be spent is very important. Number three, services such as healthcare, education, and social security are affected by voting. Some examples include the Affordable Care Act passed in 2010 gives subsidies to consumers purchasing health care that lowers the cost for households with incomes between 100% and 400% on the federal poverty level. No Child Left Behind Act of 2001 requires each state to establish state academic standards and a state testing system to verify that those standards are met. The Social Security Act of 1935 established a system of federal old age benefits, as well as those that suffered from industrial work accidents, provided unemployment insurance and aid for dependent mothers with children, the blind and handicapped. Number four, civic responsibility. There are no requirements for becoming president or a senator other than age and citizenship. Candidates need support, and the winner of an election is determined by what the people are willing to support. Your vote represents which policies you're willing to support and which you aren't going to support. If you don't exercise your right to vote, be assured that others will, and this could influence policy in a way that might not represent your interests. Number five, make government better. Voting can influence who runs for office and how they behave once they do. Some examples include national parks, social security, Medicare. These are all the creation of specific presidents and were once all controversial. Federal voting laws. These are laws meant to protect your right to vote and make it more accessible for all citizens to exercise their right to vote. The first federal voting law that we will discuss is the Civil Rights Act of 1870. During Reconstruction, these measures were passed to enforce the 15th Amendment. It forbids states from preventing anyone from voting on the basis of race. There would be criminal consequences to anyone using acts of violence or threats as a means to stop African Americans from voting. The second federal voting law that we will discuss is the Voting Rights Act of 1965. As a result of the barriers that African Americans faced in the South, this was passed with the goal of increasing the number of African Americans registered to vote. Even though the Civil Rights Act of 1870 disallowed voter discrimination based on race, the issue lied with the fact that the local officials still continued to enact discriminatory measures. This act allowed the federal government to take control of functions that were once entirely dictated by state and local officials. Through prohibiting literacy tests and the appointments of federal examiners, the federal government could now regulate areas that had a history of voter discrimination. Next on our topic of discussion is the Voting Accessibility for the Elderly and Handicapped Act of 1984. This act requires polling places for federal elections to be physically accessible to those that are disabled. Voter registration materials, as well as voting aids, must also be available for disabled and elderly individuals. Next, we will talk about the Uniformed and Overseas Citizens Absentee Voting Act of 1986. This allows for certain members to vote and register in absentee in U.S. federal elections. These groups include members of the U.S. Uniformed Services, their family members, and citizens residing outside the U.S. 
Now we will talk about a very important federal voting law, the National Voting Registration Act of 1993. This is also known as the Motor Vehicle Registration Act, and it was created to make it easier for all Americans to register to vote and maintain the registration. It does this by requiring states to provide citizens with an opportunity to register to vote at the time they seek to obtain or renew their driver's license. In addition to all this, it also requires states to keep more accurate voter registration lists. The U.S. Election Assistance Commission notes that during the 2016 election cycle that 33% of all voter registration applicants or 25 million applicants originated in the DMV. The last voter law we would like to share with you today is the Help America Vote Act of 2002, also known as HAVA. The Help America Vote Act of 2002 did three important things. Number one, created a new federal agency to serve as a clearinghouse for election administration information. Number two, provided funds to states to improve election administration and replace outdated voting systems. And three, created minimum standards for states to follow in several key areas of election administration. These were to ensure minimum standards in voter education, registration, and ballots. This includes the Department of Justice releasing a guide to help improve accessibility for disabled voters. So I know you're all wondering, who administers elections in Georgia? The Elections Division of the Secretary of State's office organizes and oversees all election activity, including voter registration, municipal, state, county, and federal elections. They are responsible for certification of election results as well as certifying the qualifications of candidates and preparation of ballots and election forms and materials. The Elections Division maintains the statewide voter registration database to ensure that voter registration lists are current statewide. They are also accountable for investigating election fraud and enforcing state election laws. What is the voting process in Georgia? We want you to be prepared on election day, so here's a brief summary of what you need to do in order to vote in the state of Georgia. We're going to go over all this information in much more depth in the next video on voter registration and ballots. So if you still have questions at the end of this, be sure to check out that video as well. Number one, make sure you're eligible to vote according to Georgia state law. This means, be a citizen of the United States, be a legal resident of the county, be at least 17 and a half years of age to register and 18 years of age to vote, not be serving a sentence for conviction of a felony involving moral turpitude, have not been found mentally incompetent by a judge. Number two, fill out and submit a voter registration application. You can do this by mail or online. If you're doing it online, click the link on the slide or copy and paste it into your browser. It'll take you to the state of Georgia's online voter registration system where you can register to vote. Check to confirm if you're already registered and make changes to your current registration record. If you're doing it by mail, then you can follow the second link, which will take you to a PDF file of a voter's registration form. You can print it out and mail it to the Secretary of State's office. After you register, the Secretary of State will send your precinct card to your county, who will then send it to you. Your precinct card lets you know where you need to go in order to vote. It is important to note that you don't need to bring your precinct card to vote. If you can't find your precinct card or you haven't received it in three to four weeks of completing and submitting your voter registration application, contact your local registration office to request a new card or check the status of your application. We've provided a link in the slide to the Muskogee County Registrar, but in case you're viewing this video and you live in another county, there's also a link to the search engine that allows you to find your county registrar's contact information. To verify that you've properly registered, we've also provided a link to the Secretary of State's My Voter page that allows you to do this. 
Remember to verify that you have successfully registered ahead of time before the election in case there were any discrepancies or issues with your registration application. Number four, go vote. Here are a few things that we'd like you to keep in mind before the big day. Remember to check the Secretary of State's election calendar so you know the date of upcoming elections as well as registration deadlines. Locate your polling place by using the My Voter website provided to you in our slides as well as the resources page. Polls open at 7 a.m. and close at 7 p.m. If you can't vote during those times, you can vote by absentee ballot. Remember to bring photo ID. You'll need a driver's license, passport, or voter identification card. The polls offer audio ballots for voters who are blind or have low vision and booths for voters in wheelchairs. If you need help with your ballot, you can ask a family member or friend to come with you to the polls and fill out the ballot in with your choices. Keep in mind that if you have moved recently, you must file a notice of your new address in writing to your county board registrar's office. There's a link to that here. You can also submit a new voter registration application using these links provided. Voting during the COVID-19 pandemic. It's important during this time to maintain safe social distancing measures to prevent the spread of COVID-19. Georgia's Secretary of State has taken several measures to help citizens continue social distancing, even during elections. Absentee ballot request forms have been sent to 6.9 million voters. If possible, vote at home by using an absentee ballot in order to avoid the risk of spreading the virus at the polls. If you did not receive an absentee ballot request form, you can always download and fill out an application using the link provided on this slide. You must submit your application to your local county board of registrar's office, either by email, mail, or fax. Choose how you want to request your absentee ballot and follow the simple steps on these slides. If you can't vote by absentee ballot, Use the link on the slide to find early voting locations in your county. This way you can avoid the crowds on election day. And finally, if you have to vote in person, just be sure to wear a mask and stand six feet apart from people to avoid any contact that might lead to spreading COVID-19. Here's the 2020 state elections and voter registration calendar. Please note that for the November 3rd presidential election, the voter registration deadline is going to be October 5th, 2020. Resources. This slide contains all the links to the information that we've given you throughout the presentation, including the Georgia Secretary of State's website, U.S. voting and election laws, elections and voter registration calendars, the voter registration application, the absentee ballot download, how to register to vote, information on the U.S. Elections Assistance Commission, Georgia's online voter registration system, the My Voter page portal, the County Registrar Search Bank, and a link to find your early voting polling stations in your county. I'm Erica with the Teen Department at Columbus Public Library. And I'm Keyshawn in Adult Services. Thanks for joining us in our voter education series. And join us again next week for part two on voter registration and ballots. Bye. Bye.